What's up, everybody? Welcome to the first ever edition of Agave Warriors. I'm Eddie Tobias, aka Eddie Nomadic, and joining me today is my first guest. It is Dom Dominic. Hey, thanks for having me. I actually didn't know I was your first guest ever. That's pretty. I'm yeah. Honored, very honored right now. So this is the inaugural uh, show, uh, the first ever show of many. Um, basically, Agave Wars is all about uh, talking about tequila, talking about wrestling. Um, I'll invite different wrestlers in the industry, um, students that are out there working right now, come from APW, um, anyone in the wrestling industry, come in and talk a little bit about their career. Meanwhile, also introduce them to some really good craft tequila. So today's video is actually sponsored by Rudo Technico Tequila. Um, so follow them on Facebook. Um, also be making some YouTube videos for them. But yeah, so this is our first ever episode. Welcome, Dom. <laughs> and we're filming in our very own apartment. Uh, so my apartment is here. We've set up the background. You can see all of our fun trinkets and things. Um, Dad's on the shelf over here with my empty bottles. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, so welcome to the first episode. So Dom, let's get right into this, man. So um, I met you a year ago. Um, started training well, over a year and a half ago, actually. So we started training at APW. Um, my initial thought was, hey, I, I make wrestling films. Um, I want to learn what it takes to actually do the moves versus hiring someone else to do them for us. So um, I joined, talked to George, and then like ran into you day one, mm -hmm. um, went through some of the basics like headlock, you know, um, how to set your feet up in the ring, that kind of stuff. Uh, and then, you know, kind of blow up from there. And then you graduated like the next month, I believe, next month and a half. And I told you, hey, you know, as a graduation gift, I get you a bottle of tequila. And you've been drinking this stuff ever since. You really liked it. So, like, first off, tell us, tell the fans who you are, what you do, uh, and, you know, how you got involved. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Uh, that bottle you got me actually did not last long in the house. I drank it fast, but uh, I've been getting it ever since. It's my go to tequila. Uh, but my name is uh, Dominic Lavecchio. Uh, I work uh, under the name uh, Blue Blade. It's a masked uh, uh, luchador gimmick um, that was kind of uh, put on to me by George DeLisa after uh, working at APW for a good while. I've been wrestling for about three and a half years now, uh, mostly in the Austin area. I ventured out and around Central Texas, but I mostly like to stay in Austin. And in my spare time, I. Uh, Hang out with my cat and uh, my lovely wife. So that's about it. So what what was it that like spoke to you when it started when you started getting into wrestling? What was your first day like? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna train and as be a wrestler. Well, I always grew up watching wrestling. I, Ray Mysterio was my hero um, back in those old WCW days. And uh, you know, I was watching wrestling one day, and it, it dawned upon me that obviously this is some sort of skills art. Where do you learn how to do this? How can you possibly learn how to do this? So I started looking around and I found uh, America's Academy of Professional Wrestling. And I just gave them a call to see how it's going. I watched a couple practices and then I, I was hooked. I signed up and I just haven't really looked back since. It's just been something I've always wanted to do and I've been able to do it now. I've been pretty physical most of my life. I wrestled in high school. Did a lot of MMA in college, and then this was a good chance to just kind of uh, use that physicality in an art form. I don't really play an instrument, I can't sing, but I wanted to create something. But you played ukulele earlier, I mean, you were jamming. <laughs> Barely. <laughs> <laughs> like, I've always wanted to be a creator, but I can't paint. I can't, yeah. I'm not a writer, I'm not clever enough for that, but I, I feel like I had some physical gifts I wanted to uh, try and use in, in a creative way, and that was kind of how it all started. So, do you feel that like wrestling itself? I mean, when you first started, probably being a hobby or interest, but now you've seen it become its own art form. How have you seen that kind of art form come to be or like flow? Um, well, I, I guess I've seen the progression from like my first matches, which were just awful. Not that I look at matches now and think they're great, but um, the progression kind of has been trying to tell that story within the match. It used to just do moves and try and get out there and get cheers. Now I'm going out there trying to. Uh, tell something like the, this is what's happening here and, and do it not with using a lot of words but the throughout the course of a match and that's become kind of that art form and I think I'm getting a little better at it but it's something that I don't think you'll ever stop learning and trying to hone that craft yeah and what's what's been like the biggest change you've seen and obviously less last year mm -hmm. um, for those of you who don't know um, George La Isla ran the school for a long time um, alongside with Ray Pavadon Campos Ray Pavadon went a different route for about a year and a half um, and then now came back 
help George Del Isla retire, um, you know, run the company for him and help him out and make sure the legacy grows. So what have you noticed, I guess, in your in the year that we've met to, to now? Like, what's kind of been the biggest change that you've been excited to see? Um, with the school? Well, I guess in your life in general. Yeah, right? yeah. Um, well, it's actually, it's all been a, uh, been a whirlwind for sure. Uh, on the surface, on the face value, my moveset's changed. I've been doing a lot more things, especially like uh, as I keep trying to just always get more like that lucha moveset, and it's always progressed. Um, but uh, setting up the match, kind of putting moves in a place where they make more sense, doing them with more intensity, uh, making sure they're crisp, uh, all of that has just, I feel like, progressed in a way that I like, but I'm still working for. For the school, I mean, we're just getting a big footprint on the, in the digital world, getting, uh, we moved to a big facility, got multiple rings, uh, just, it's just been, uh, it's been like a rocket ship has taken off, really, it feels like, from the days of being in this warehouse in Pflugerville to a real nice facility over in North Austin. So. And now we have Twitch, of course, yeah. it's uh, twitch.tv slash official APW, um, and we get a chance to really showcase all the students and the graduates, and like, basically their, their work. Uh, yeah. If any artist would go and work, like you said, on a painting or something, then they would put it up in a gallery display. And, well, at our school, we have the opportunity to do that every Saturday, but with the students and showcasing what they're learning. So that's really the true, you know, heart of the show is to kind of showcase, you know, oh, what moveset did they learn this week and how can they put that together in a show? What character? So, like, what what do you see, you know, changing? Like what you said, getting introduced to the digital realm mm -hmm. and having a new era of our, you know, APW kind of turning into that, you know, now we're kind of a television show every Saturday. Yeah. So how do you feel like being on a TV show, even though it's not like NBC or ABC or anything <laughs> like that, but like being able to be seen anywhere around the world on a TV show? Yeah, it's in the front of my mind a lot more than it used to be. It used to always just be whoever's in house is what's seen is who's seen this. Or uh, sometimes my wife would film, uh, you know, with her phone from the audience. But now it's an entire worldwide audience, technically, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, and for us also, it's just this, these weekly shows. Every week we're out there, so it, it, nothing can recreate that live match environment, no matter how much practice you make, you know, how much you work with someone, yeah, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays when we train, nothing re can recreate that match, like uh, atmosphere, uh, feeling the crowd, um, trying to adjust on the fly when things aren't exactly where, where you want it to be, uh, improv, all that kind of comes together in a way that you can't recreate. So doing that every week just means you get better in that live match environment every week. Right. So that's been... And I'm sure. So like, what are some of your goals and, and dreams, you know, aspirations for your wrestling career? Where do you see it? Is it something that you definitely want to, you know, eventually take full time and, and go maybe try out for different promotions? Um, or is it something you just see, you, you know, some people are really happy with just being in the indie scene and being able to wrestle on the weekends and, you know, live, live a normal, normal life during the week? What, what do you see right now where you're going with it? I mean, I guess you always want to set really lofty goals. You want to go, so you do anything in, the, in your life, whether it's wrestling or not, you want to always be the best at it and shoot as far as you can. And that's kind of where I'm at. But life does get in the way a lot. So I am in that indie, do it on the weekends kind of scene. Uh, I would love to break out of that. Uh, it's it's there's a lot of competition, especially in Texas. There's just a ton of talent out here, so um, I'm trying to reconcile those lofty goals you want to set for yourself with realism. Especially when I have a nine to five that is absolutely paying my bills when wrestling is not. Yeah. Um, so I you, you try to live both worlds, and you want to get into that full time one, but um, you know sometimes on on days where your confidence is shook, it, it gets kind of tough to sit there and go, oh, man, to think I want to be in WWE one day. Um, sometimes you just got to push that down. It, it, it's tough. It's, it's As much as I love wrestling, wrestling won't always love you back. So I got to keep that in mind. What's, well, like when, you're, when you find yourself at a low point, what's something that you think you tell yourself, you know, to kind of keep moving forward and kind of keep going? Um, because obviously, you know, some people, either they stop or they give up doing whatever it is, their dream, you know, whether it's like, plumbing or baking or anything mm -hmm. right they're like they they work hard and they're like oh man like if they stopped so short and they kept going for a month they would have hit that you know gold mine or, or, or you know break so what do you tell yourself to kind of get through to keep going through those tough days that's a great question uh what i do is i set a realistic goal that i 
I can get within wrestling. So um, right now, uh, I'm really trying to fight for the AEPW Heavyweight Championship. So that's my next goal. That's the one I'm going to try and do. So when I'm having a bad week or a bad day and, and the big goals are, are seem just so far away, just remember like maybe there's another one that I can get on the way to the next one that makes this more realistic. It could be as big as the, the AEPW Championship, which is big to me, and it could be as small as maybe learning a new move learning or really tightening up a move I have in my move set as well. So those are just kind of set something that's a little bit more within reach, pull myself forward, and then... I feel like I'm a little closer to that, that, that goal that's further away. So well, let's um, step forward a little bit. So let's say you are in the WWE or Ring of Honor or New Japan, like any one of all the worlds. Like, who would be like your dream match? Oh, um, probably Sami Zayn. I, I feel a kindred uh, spirit with him. He's been one of my favorites to watch. Uh, watching um, his old Ring of Honor days and then seeing how when he got hurt, I was super bummed. But. Um, I just see the way he works, the way he storytells, uh, and the way uh, he's been. With, I think he's just one of the best wrestlers in WWE. I think he's a little underutilized, but that's a, you know I digress. Uh, I think it'd be a match where he would also maybe be a little bit uh, uh, patient with me as I'm trying to catch up with someone who's I think such a yeah. you know level higher. So that'd be kind of nice. What's it like being at that level and then having new students come in and wrestle with you on the shows every Saturday? And kind of like guiding them to catch up with you because you've been doing it for a while. So like, you know, what's it like working with someone who's who's green and fresh and green? Um, I uh, I'm not I don't see myself as a great teacher, so I'm not very good with the new 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 people with like learning how to take a bump. Mm -hmm. But I do really well with the intermediates, and you know I, I always tell them the same thing, which is like, hey man, I haven't done shit in this this business, but I can promise you this: that I will tell you, I will teach you everything I know, and then. From the point where I've taught you everything I know, you and I will be peers and we can start learning new things together. Uh, but I love it. Um, when when someone wants to like work with me and I, I have no problem trying to put over young talent, um, I, I always find it's kind of an honor when they, if they've asked for me, if they want to work with me. And uh, I always like showing people a new move. Um, I, you know, a lot of times these younger guys, especially some of these, like they're in their early 20s, they can't even drink yet. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> this guy's living for you. <laughs> like, you know, like, like good, just, yeah, I'll, I, I will absolutely be your first step on your journey. <laughs> like, and, and that's kind of how I see it. Well, well, speaking of drinking, so part of it, you know, thank you so much for sharing that with us. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move forward a little bit and step into the tequila teaching. Um, so are you aware of like how tequila is made or how? Absolutely. What's... What's your what is your knowledge so far of how tequila is made? Um, okay, well I know that it's awful when it's in a Jose Cuervo bottle. I know that much. <laughs> okay, um, but from my understanding, it's blue agave, uh -huh. and um, it's uh, in an oak barrel, and uh, usually it doesn't need to um, ferment too long. And that it, the older it gets, the more darker it gets, and that's uh, like a smokier aged tequila. And it, I think I've exhausted everything I have <laughs> learned. Not, not too bad, not too bad. Um, so, so, what are your kind of favorite types of tequilas? Are you, because uh, there's, you know, there's three, right? Mm -hmm. So, you have Blanco, Reposado, mm -hmm. and Añejo. Mm -hmm. um, and then, if you want to count Mezcal, you can count Mezcal, but that's a Mezcal, not a tequila. Yeah. Um, but, what is your favorite type so far? Like, you tried a little bit of everything? And, yeah, probably the Añejo. Yeah. Um, I, uh, in college, I used to hate tequila because it was on Jose Cuervo, and I never really got to, like, every time I drank it, it was always like, ugh, I was just miserable. And then one day in Los Angeles, I was working on a TV show following Jenny Rivera, who was a uh, Mexican yeah, yeah. officer, right? And in the episode, she was throwing a party, and she was pouring shots for everyone, and then she started pouring shots for the crew members. And I'm thinking, she said, hands me this one, like, and I'm like, oh no. I'm thinking these college days, like, I hate tequila. And it was very dark, very, very yeah. smoky. And I, I drank it, and it was delicious. It was so good. It was so smooth. And it was everything I, I didn't know tequila could be. And ever since then, I've been chasing to find out what that was. And yeah. I haven't been able to find it. I don't. I, mean, I know what it looks like, but uh, well, I man, that's a great honor to have a you know Jenny Rivera to give you a, a shot of tequila. Like, and uh, I'm assuming because obviously she's uh, you know well to do. It was probably something very expensive, but 
it at least uh, awoken me into a world of tequila that I didn't know existed, and so now it's just been dark tequila after dark tequila. I'm always trying it. Always looks like Añejos are definitely yeah. It's so um, I think I have an Añejo you might like. So I brought. So this is the Technico Añejo. You guys can see here. Hold up the bottle there for Dom. So Technico Añejo. Um, it's 100% blue agave, right? Oh yeah, Dom does the the bottle shot, of course. Um, so it's 100% blue agave, right? And you're right. So they they make uh, the tequila with blue agave. Um, the way it's made is they will the jimadores or the guys that have or women sometimes will go out there and just you know chop at the blue agave. Um, they chop off the little spikes and they make what's left is called the the piña or the pine. So it's like a little pine cone basically with all the stuff chopped off. They gather all that, they throw it into like a stone oven, and they uh, roast it and steam for like three days ish. Um, and then it starts getting all like charred and golden and brown. Um, so they throw that and they uh, mulch it. So they basically turn it into like the strains. Um, the fibers are mulched down, and you have this massive stone wheel that goes around and it crunches all the fibers and squeezes out all the agave nectar. So that's how we have like pure agave nectar. So that's our process. Mm -hmm. Well, when you add yeast to that agave nectar um, and you ferment it in a big barrel, right? That's how you get, so you ferment it for like three days, four days. Each tequila is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. But that fermentation process then gets distilled. So the vapors of that, that's how you get Blanco. Mm -hmm. So then that takes roughly three days-ish to make, right? And it's distilled twice. Anything distilled, you know, before that and then after that. But what makes craft tequila a little bit different is that these big distilleries like the Cuervo that you're drinking, that's a mix. Mm -hmm. So instead of being 100% pure blue agave, mm -hmm. it's like 51 mixed with 49% of like other starches and corns and sugars uh, and things to throw in to make up for it. So that's why Cuervo gives you a hangover. Mm -hmm. If you're drinking anything with pure 100% um, blue agave, you will not get a hangover because the sugar is obviously what gives you a hangover, and yeah. all of the sugar in the agave has been turned into a tequila. So when you throw the Blanco in, um, you age it, that's where you get Reposado. Mm -hmm. Anything aged from like four months to a year is a Reposado, Any, or eh, two months to a year, really. Um, but anything after that is considered an Añejo. Mm -hmm. So the dark, dark one, it can be anywhere from uh, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, like. Every Añejo is aged a little bit different. So this one is aged for about 18 months. Okay. Um, so let me go ahead and pour you a little bit so you can try it. And you said you never tried this so one before. I have not. No, I'm super excited. So I'll give you a little taster there. You guys can see the... So the bottle itself uh, has a luchador on it, which is why I love Red Rudo Tinko. Um, fits really well with the wrestling scheme, so just give it a little sip. So let me know what you think. Yeah. Salud. Mm. Tell me what you're tasting. What do you think? Um, well, it's very smooth, which I really like. Yeah, it's got the smokiness to it. Mm. A little sweetness. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the uh, Technico Añejo is actually made in old American oak barrels. Um, and it, the barrels are uh, dipped in liqueur. Oh. So the sweetness from the Añejo is the butterscotch and caramel that you're getting from the, from the actual liqueur. Um, so that by itself, again, good sipping tequila, nice. Um, anyway, so uh, that's a little sip. Uh, I wanted you to try it. Let me see what you think. But you being the technical, being the blue blade, like mm -hmm. um, while I pour a little bit more so you can try with the food that we've got going on, um, I want you to tell me about, you know, the idea behind blue blade. What was like your whole, I mean, it was dawned upon you by George and Isla, yeah. but I mean, now you've kind of gone through some progressive changes. Uh, your new mask almost looks like the one in the, in the bottle. Uh, the old mask looked like the one from the Blanco bottle. So yeah. it's kind of like, you know, getting a little bit of inspiration. But your photos that you posted up on the Facebook mm -hmm. um, were with the new bottles. So, like, what what was the whole inspiration behind Blue Blade? Um, well, uh, when I first walked into George Daly's office, I, you know, he, he always asked, like, who's your favorite wrestler? You know, why you want to be here? And I told him about my uh, Rey Mysterio dreams. And, uh, you know, I am... Uh, the, the whitest guy I've ever met. And so I kind of laughed at that, um, which I actually really, um, 
that was always great because uh, wrestling is great for everybody, you know. But uh, I just started training without any gimmick in mind, any kind of idea. Um, but then uh, Don, uh, I got the, uh, the, the mask Don to Pommy when he wanted me to do it. It's actually been like a school um, mantle, really, is what I've kind of turned it into. Um, that uh, we've put, he's like carried on from uh, certain wrestlers onto, onto me. Mm-hmm. So I thought it was really cool. Uh, when he first told me the name, I got a little thrown off because I immediately thought of Blue Blazer and I was like, oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Um, right. but, uh, uh, I just kind of really started morphing into it because I, I, as soon as I put on, I went down to um, South Congress and I started looking at masks down there to see what, you know, go get one. And, um, and as soon as I put it on, I just haven't looked back because I, as I put it on, I walked out and I, I, I felt like, I felt like I got to be Ray Mysterio for yeah. a night. And at the time, I wasn't like fully gonna like this is everything I'm gonna be with wrestling. And I, I was planning to eventually, you know, show my face somewhere. Uh, but then I just kept wrestling, kept wrestling, and now I've morphed it into. Uh, uh, I guess I, my first tagline was like the White Knight of Luchadors, mm-hmm. uh, but now uh, it's really formed into just uh, someone who uh, I, uh, every time I try to cut a promo, I would mention like the Lucha Spirit. Like I treat Lucha like a, like a religion, and, uh, you know. When I, I go against uh, the the Rudos who are you know uh, degrading lucha, and that's yeah. kind of where I formed uh, that because it kind of mirrored just really how I felt about the art form and and you know trying to be that little kid watching Rey Mysterio hit that six one nine. Now you know I get to uh, get to do it in the ring yeah, yourself. Yeah, <laughs> you get protected with lucha. Yeah, and that's kind of formed over. It. It's kind of bled over. Who are some of your like? I mean, obviously, like the mask wrestling. You said Rey Mysterio, but like, are there any ones in Mexico that you grow? I mean, obviously, I have like Mean Mascaras and you know yeah. Blue Demon and stuff were some of mine. You know, growing up, Santo, obviously. Yeah. But yeah. what were some of the mask wrestlers you saw going through? You know, WCW and yeah. you know the ranks. Well, uh, my mask uh, is inspired by Mysterio Sodos. Uh, I think that is Rey's great uncle or something mm-hmm. like that. Um, but uh, Demon Junior for sure. Um, El Santo, um, I mentioned Sami Zayn, so El Generico. El Generico, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, like that. I actually think WWE doesn't do masked wrestlers that well, which is what kind of bums me out because I've always been a big fan of the mask. Well, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of uh, the Lucha House Party right now. Yeah. Like Kalisto and, yeah. you know, um, was it Lince and then also uh, Metalik. Like yeah. those guys are just awesome as, as a trio. I, I agree. Uh, I remember Lucha Dragons were running around for a little bit too. They got kind of like a half ass push, but I, I was, uh, I've always liked um, Sin Cara. And- Sin Cara is great. So, like, yeah. funny story about Sin Cara. He's a great person in general. Um, I went to a WWE Live event here in Austin at the Cedar Park Center. And um, we were, I was there for a, like, a little benefit. Um, so it's helping out on one of the families. Um, family's name was uh, his son's name was DJ. Um, I had met him at Royal Rumble like last year in San Antonio, um, and gave him the Royal Rumble chair, one of the Royal Rumble chairs, mm-hmm. as a gift. Um, he loved it. So he wasn't he was too sick to actually be able to make it. Mm-hmm. Um, but now he's he was healthy, um, and, and he had you know gone through his sickness and um, fought through it. So as like a reward, his family's like, hey, we'll take you to WWE Live. Mm-hmm. Um, so we took him. And he wanted to sit with me and talk and hang out. It was yeah. like, he's a great kid. Um, and all of a sudden, Sinkata's family came to us. We were in the front row and saw us cheering. They're like, hey, we're Sinkata's family. We're driving back. We're leaving now after his match. He wants you to have front row seats for us that we had there. So we were like, okay. And I was thinking, like, let the family go. But he specifically wanted me to go with him to the front row. So we went to the front row, and we saw, like, the Usos, his favorite tag team at the time. We saw Randy Orton up front, uh, Shinsuke up front. Like, we were front row right in the front corner. It was on the entranceway, the left. If you're the wrestler going down the ramp, it's on the left side, that corner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where we were sitting. That's where Shinsuke goes. That's where, so. yeah. So we got to be there with him when he did it. And it was it was amazing. It was great. Um so that that scene, but seeing his his like face and his whole like mm-hmm. expression like that like yeah. it meant the whole world. So seeing how kids are getting involved and yeah. Yeah. I already like him but now. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's awesome. Think I was great. Um, yeah. All right, so we had a little bit of tequila. 
I wanted you to try it with like a pairing of like food. Um, so a little bit of education, right? Like some tequila. So with the añejos, they're a little bit sweeter, mm -hmm. right? A little bit smokier. So you want to have them with some sort of meat. So um, I made some chicken fajitas. Well, actually, Kendall made some chicken fajitas. She heated them all up for us while we were setting up. Uh, so she made some chicken fajitas. Um, so if you want, take a little sip, take a bite. Let me know what you think. It's really smooth when it goes down. It's oh, so. Yeah. As soon as it hits your lips, like the, the sweetness, it really, really pops. Mm -hmm. You did good, Kendall. Thanks. <laughs> there a little, some good credit. Mm. Like, really, I mean, it's like marinated chicken fajitas, but like the lime juice. The one thing I like about añejos to blancos, so blancos. Obviously, the agave is um, very citrusy. So if you have anything added more citrus to it, it's going to taste tart. Mm -hmm. So some of you out there who drink margaritas and add Blanco in there, might do yourself this, uh, you know, this favor because mm -hmm. it's already kind of you know yeah. uh, citrusy. But if you do like a Reposado or Añejo, oh man, citrus like pairs well with it as well. Um, so yeah, so like the lime juice definitely like pops out when you're eating like chicken fajitas. That's good to know. Because uh, I have a bottle of technical at my house, and it's a Blanco, and mm. I, I have to make margaritas with it. Sounds like I'm not getting the most out of it. <laughs> it's it, it's a like it's a taste preference, um, but like having tasted a lot of these and going through and um, you know working with you know Patrick at, at Double Eagle and learning a lot behind the scenes of you know how tequila is made, mm -hmm. it's just like so much fun. And so like and like I said, you know, tasting it like we're not doing like this is like a little sipper. We're not really doing shots over here. But, I mean, the flavor is so, like, powerful. Mm -hmm. um, and I normally, like, when you think, okay, just get a frozen margarita at the bar, mm -hmm. and then, you know, you, you mix it with, the, like, the Corvo or um, Patron that's been distilled, you yeah. know, with, a, with a, like, a large factory. So when you have a distillery that mass produces, you're, lo you're losing a lot of that quality. Um, not to say Patron's a terrible tequila. Yeah. Like, it's, it's pretty good. But when you, it's like saying craft beer, like would you rather have a Shiner or would you have like a Bud Light? Exactly. You know, kind of like. Yeah. Um, like Patron's not bad, but like the whole Patron on ice like wrapper thing, like it's like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it gets branded at that point. I'd much rather. I like. Uh, I really like you know tasting different things. I bartended for like two and a half years, mm -hmm. um, and so now learning about the different like tequilas and stuff is is really fun. All right, so I made a drink, a mixed drink, and I know you saw it on Instagram when I posted a while back, but I've donned it, the Blue Blade. I think that having someone who comes on the show and like we talk and hang out, um, they deserve their own mixed cocktail. So uh, I will make a video about that a little bit later. Essentially what I've done is I've used the Tecnico Añejo, uh, and I have mixed in about uh, one and a half ounces of the Tecnico Añejo, I did about half an ounce of some of the blue uh, curacao, curacao, mm -hmm. however you pronounce it. Uh, English was my second language growing up, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then um, you have uh, 0.75 ounces of lime juice, mm -hmm. and then just a splash of like topo chico on top. So basically, that is what you get to make the blue blade. So here's the blue blade, right there. Blue AF. <laughs> blue AF. Uh, so yeah, so cheers. cheers Give it a sip. Let me know what you think. We'll slam there on the. Mm. Oh, that's dangerous. <laughs> I, guess I guess that means it's good. good. No, yeah, it means uh, I could drink a lot of it before I realize I should stop. <laughs> I like, and I mean, again, it's all about the flavor. Like I was talking about the citrus. So yeah. you can still taste the añejo tequila. Mm -hmm. A little bit of lime juice in there. Um, the blue curacao is not like as sweet, mm -hmm. so I use very little of it. And then of course the, you know, Topo yeah. Chico, and it's just like, it's super refreshing. It's got this uh, like fruit punch vibe to it, but um, with a little bit of bubbles in it. I, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I could get used to this. Mm. Well, let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, you're, you've talked about where you want to be, where you're at right now at APW in wrestling in general. Um, so let's let's review a little of what you've seen and what's inspiring. So this last Sunday was SummerSlam. Mm. 
what was your take on it? What did you watch? What did you like? What inspired you? What do you want to practice in the ring? Like, you know, yeah. tell me about it. I was thoroughly sports entertained. I would say uh, there was a couple of uh, maybe some little dead spots, but overall, I, I effing loved it. Um, let's see what inspired me. Um, I would say the Miz uh, uh, Daniel Bryan match inspired me oh, a lot yeah. with storytelling. That's what I really liked. Um, uh, you know, it's a little hard to get those opportunities um, in the indie scene to like really develop a storyline almost over the course of like seven or eight years for them. But um, that and like wonderful heel shit, like taking a breast knuckles and punching someone in the face yeah. after, you know, this whole thing really kind of started where he was like, oh, Miz doesn't want to take punches to the face. Oh, and then bam. like, so like all of that was just this like wonderful storytelling. Yeah, every time Miz tried to like, do Daniel's moves on him, it kind of backfired. It just, I, I loved all that storytelling. So that was probably one of my bigger inspirations to be like, you know, I gotta go out there and make sure that what I do in the ring, everyone will be able to understand. You know, and don't move fast. Like, let's make sure everyone's on the next page and then we go on to the next part of that match. And I think we can really get people invested and really start really starting to care about like what happens next and like why I did something and they understand why I did it or with the heel too and the same deal, you know. So that was probably my favorite match of the night. Were you able to watch the uh, NXT TakeOver event by any chance? I, uh, I only got a little bit of that. Oh, Saturday right. night, I, uh, I, I don't know if that's Saturday night I wrestle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's hard to get uh, uh, all that, but I did see a good chunk of the um, Ricochet uh, Adam Cole match, which was just nuts. So yeah. That match was bananas. I loved it. So, uh, did you yeah. see like the, the false finish of mm -hmm. the moonsault mm -hmm. kick? Yeah. Uh, the timing, yeah. timing on that was was just mind blowing. I mean, he literally like turned his head at the exact moment uh -huh. that his foot came. I mean, he had to have worked on that multiple times and really trust the guy you're working with too. Yeah, either um, either that spot goes perfectly like it did, or someone's in the hospital. So yeah. it was it was it was perfect. Well, that's why they're, they're like paid high dollars and that you know the pros. pros yeah it helps that ricochet is the main gravity for god because he just floats up there every time he like just do you get like inspired to see like the different high fly moves because i mean blue blade is a high flyer but you are yeah. you know working his you know different move sets in there as well um it, i go both ways it depends sometimes it's definitely inspirational because he's so good but other times i watch him do something and my first thought is like shit i could never do that yeah that is insane, you know, and, and so I have to work between both of that, and, and um, that's just about confidence to be like, no, you know what, I can't do that, uh, but I don't know if that man is uh, in, in another world, I'm, uh, I'm a big Ricochet fan, <laughs> yeah, and then Prince Puma, that's another master wrestler, uh, well, when Lucha Underground, you know, yeah. came out, that was, that was a big change, I mean, as far as, like, a production standpoint, it was cool to see how, you know, one, you've cut your show to just one hour versus it being three hours like Raw or two hours like, you know, SmackDown, um, which 205 Live, you know, is getting that one hour time frame. But their, their behind the scenes stuff, their cut scene stuff was shot like a movie, like yeah. a Robert Rodriguez movie. Yeah. He's producing it, so it's like, hey man, I'm going to go and shoot all the stuff myself, all the guys. Shadow, like, yeah, yeah, like the contrast of orange, like, I'm, I'm red, green, colorblind deficient, and Kendall got me some glasses mm -hmm. that helped me see more, you know, reds and greens, so it's great to see, like, look outside, actually see the different shades of green in the tree, but I I'm, I don't even want to put them on to watch Lucha Underground, because it's already so, yeah. con like, orange and red in your face, um, like, when they have, uh, you know, Benta do, uh, you know, uh, a move or, like, do something where he's, like, got blood all over mm -hmm. his, you know, his face, it's just, like, super red. Yeah. So when they edit it, they put the, the saturation way yeah. up. Yeah, it's like film noir meets uh, telenovela. Yeah. yeah. Like, yes. And that's, I mean, I guess that's why, like, Mexicans love Lucha so much, because it is telenovela. I mean, that's all we do is watch telenovelas, you know, on primetime hours. Like, I remember, you know, being with my family and, like, not understanding a lot, mm -hmm. but knowing the drama that was happening, because like, oh, I could see the, the yeah, <laughs> like, what's going on? So, like, telenovelas work, you know, really well as far as, like, getting dramatic action and so seeing that like in the ring every week, like when that light bulb hit, mm. when I was like, oh, hey, you know, because I've been training for, you know, I don't know, a year and a half now, mm. but mainly like I love doing the behind the scenes stuff. So like doing the Twitch show, mm -hmm. making the flyers and posters, you know, when that little light bulb of like, oh, I can make these stories that 
Pops is trying to make go further by doing a promo on the green screen or doing yeah. something, you know, directing. Um, that little light bulb went on, and I was like, okay, cool. I got this idea, this idea. We can do this. Yeah, it's been great. I love that uh, Pluto Mars is a promo. He's a, he's a <laughs> alien, a resident alien in APW, and he's like floating in space as he's talking about uh, getting hit with a kendo, a kendo stick made of solar beams. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, this is... This is a steel, steel, steel chair of lasers. Yeah. <laughs> it was... It, it's... But that's what makes it fun. Like, you guys get the opportunity and freedom to, to you know, help your characters grow and get out there. Uh, if you worked for a different company, they would probably tell you, like, oh, hey, this is what you're doing. Yeah. This is you're changing your character. And so now it's, like, learning from scratch. Yeah, you gave us a canvas, so it's perfect. It's, it works out really nice. It's, it's fun. fun. Um, so what are, you, what are you seeing? You know, what's something that you would want to do creatively with Blue Blade? You know, we've, we've done the uh, 8x10s and, you know, mm -hmm. the standard way of traditional media. Yeah. Um, but are you seeing, like, a big change? Like, our Facebook advertisements are going out. So, mm -hmm. like, to boost yourself as an independent wrestler, yeah. are you thinking about using, you know, Facebook and, and Instagram and Twitter more? So you do have an Instagram account. I do. Well, that Instagram is more of a behind-the-scenes. It's more me. Uh, my Facebook's my official, like, uh, like not destroying the business uh, yeah. page, which is uh, the official Blue Blade, uh, my Facebook. Um I'd like to see a little bit more comedy coming out of Blue Blade. I want to see Blue Blade going to the grocery store in his mask, you know, doing his thing. Um, but on the other end of that, I also want to do a, a bit of a heel turn. I think it's time for Blue Blade's been a face for about three years now. So I'd like to see Blue Blade get a little pissed off and start kicking people in the face. So yeah. um, uh, I think both those things can be on the horizon. Um, I just have to. Uh, get to the grocery store wearing a mask and hope I don't get arrested. So. That's my always my biggest concern is like I've wanted to go out with like the Agave Warrior mask to like mm -hmm. different venues and like walk into a bar and like, hey, would you like to try this tequila? But then they'd probably look at me crazy like, what well, is this guy who wouldn't even let me in the bar? Yeah, the best case bar. scenario yeah. is like, sir, you're being arrested. You yeah. You know, what are you doing? And then they see me with a big like duffel bag Especially to carry the tequila yeah. in the bag. They're like, what's in the bag? Yeah, no, you don't want to see your face. You're sneaking out. Nah, nah, nah. Yeah. We're in a post 9 11 world, man. You can't be doing that. All right. <laughs> um, all right. So before we, uh, we leave, I'd um, like to give my guest a little bit of you know, their opportunity to either talk to the audience out there, either give them a, um, you know, a little word of advice and inspiration, or if you'd like to cut a promo and like talk to someone directly watching online, the beauty of it is it's online, so anyone could be watching. Oh. Um, but yeah, so what, what are some things that, you know, words you like to say so maybe a year from now, six months from now, Blue Blade might be actually working out there, you know, in the big leagues. Okay. Um, I guess my advice would be to young wrestlers. I know I'm not necessarily in a position to give advice because I haven't really gone very far. But what I like to say to all the young wrestlers out there would be um, take feedback. Uh, you know, if someone has taken the time to put an arm around you and give you some advice, it's so much easier to not do that. It's so easy to be like, that match sucked, and then walk away. But to sit there and go, hey, man, I noticed a couple of things. That, they, that takes time. That takes effort. They're trying to – it shows they care. I'm going to uh, name drop a little bit. Uh, Zach Taylor, he's very good at doing that. He will put an arm around me and be like, hey, man, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to do that because it looked bad for these – you know, he yeah. just, and I'm just hanging on every word because, like, thank you, man. He did not have to do that. He could have just went on about his business, did his thing. But no, he took me aside and he gave me some advice, and that's going to help. And maybe it's something you can implement immediately. But it's something you can think about moving forward. It's something you can start making changes. Uh, so that's my advice to anyone. And actually, I could apply to anyone in the real world. If someone's giving you some advice, someone you trust, listen. Don't take offense. Get better. Every day, we're trying to get better. So just do that. Wake up better than you were the day before. And, and that's how you can do that with a little bit of help and a, a second set of eyes. I think it's great advice in general. I mean, you know, always waking up in the morning and being like, hey, what can I do to be better today? Uh, awesome. Well, Dom, thank you so much for taking the time today to, you know, join me, sit down, you know, drink some tequila, taste some food. 
Um, you guys, thank you so much for watching and listening and tuning in. Uh, again, my name is Eddie Tobias, a.k.a. Eddie Nomadic online. I'm on all social media as Eddie Nomadic. Um, you can find me on um, Official AAPW. Go to twitch.tv slash Official AAPW every single Saturday at 8 p.m. This Saturday will be a different episode. We are streaming exclusively for Sabotage Wrestling, which is Thunder Rosa's mm. uh, promotion. So it'll be all women's wrestling show. Uh, and so we'll be streaming that on our channel uh, eight, at 8 o'clock. No, sorry. We'll be replaying at 8 o'clock. The show starts at 6. So tune in on our channel at 6 o'clock to catch all the action. Uh, and if you guys are interested in trying out some of the Tecnico Añejo, uh, go ahead and go to our website or go to our Facebook. It's Rudo Tecnico Tequila on Facebook. Um, and you can send us a message. We'll send you the information of your nearest location uh, of where to go. Here in Austin, um, there is a Total Wine and More you guys can go to. There's three different locations. They all carry the Tecnico Añejo. Um, just go in there and let them know that we sent you. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. We'll see you guys on the next episode. Bye.